Welcome to Chapel Street Church Online. My name is Stetson, and today is Easter Sunday. We are excited to celebrate together the joy and power of the resurrection of Christ our King. But before we do, I wanted to welcome you all and say Happy Easter. If you are new or newish to Chapel Street, please take a moment now to text hello to the number showing on the screen. I would love to help you get connected around here and answer any questions that you may have. Our service will begin shortly, and to prepare our hearts and minds to worship Jesus, the risen Savior, I thought it would be helpful for us to look back at the last week of Jesus' life and ministry. You see, early in his ministry, Jesus repeatedly told his disciples that his time had not yet come. But as he approached the final week of his life on earth, Jesus' teaching and actions clearly indicated that the time had now come, the time for Jesus to conquer sin and death and to redeem the lives of all who would trust in him. It began with hope. On, on Sunday, Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on a donkey amidst shouts of joy from the crowds. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then on Monday, Jesus visited the temple and drove out corrupt money changers, declaring that his father's house would be a house of prayer. On Tuesday, Jesus returned to the temple to preach the good news of God's kingdom, but not everyone received his message with joy. He was confronted by the Jewish authorities and questioned about his authority. By Wednesday, the religious leaders plotted to kill Jesus, and Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' closest friends and disciples, agreed to betray his Lord. And then on Thursday, Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples, a meal that they understood as celebrating God's deliverance of his people, Israel. But this time, Jesus called his body bread and the cup his blood. Later that same evening, Jesus withdrew to Gethsemane to pray to his Father for strength to face what he knew was coming. Shortly after, he was betrayed and arrested in the garden and dragged away. On Friday, Jesus stood trial before the Jewish authorities and then before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Even though Pilate found no fault with Jesus, Jesus was condemned to die. He was mocked, beaten, and led away to be crucified. As Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out to his father, asking him to forgive those who had put him there. With his final breath, Jesus offered up his spirit into the hands of his father in heaven and died. At that moment, darkness covered the land. The earth shook and the great curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and sealed in a tomb. Saturday. Silence. As the Son of God remained buried in the cold, dark tomb, the disciples scattered and all hope seemed lost. Early Sunday morning, a few women went to the tomb to anoint the lifeless body of their master. And to their shock and amazement, they found the stone rolled aside and the tomb was empty. The disciples' grief turned to joy. The word would spread throughout the whole world of the truth that we celebrate today. He is risen. up as a child, life was very hard and many other times that if we didn't have food, then we would go to scavenge in the, in the dumping site. I didn't have food the day before, neither the other day before. I only knew that I was hungry and I needed food. As a child, I grew up with a lot of hopelessness and I knew that death was the best thing for me. 
At the age of seven, I lost three family members. I lost my mom and I lost my stepdad. I lost my small brother Patrick because of the terrifying disease of HIV AIDS. In the middle of prostitution. Feeling so helpless. Poverty made me feel less valued. It made me feel not loved. It made me feel uh, less of a human. Because it's so hard when you have not eaten dinner and knowing you not have lunch and you're not assured for dinner the following day, it's just feeling very helpless, like things are not gonna be better. I lost four of my siblings due to preventable diseases. Uh, three of them died before the age of five. My sister, we were sleeping with her in the same bed and she, she had died. Things changed later when I joined the program. When I started attending the Compassion Project, I was learning about the Bible, but the most important thing for me was that I was receiving food. I got an opportunity to go to school uh, with a pair of school uniform, with a pair of shoes. My mother heard about a church that worked with children. They're taking care of me, tutors, a pastor, a compassion director. Words are very powerful. My life was changed because someone told me, I believe in you, I love you, and I know you will succeed in life. My sponsor was a college student from Michigan, and in the first letter, she just told me that she wanted to make room for me. My sponsor, he was eight years old when I was nine, so he was one year younger than me. One decision to make room for one more changed my life. Saved my life. Saved my life. Will you make room for a child that needs you? Will you make room for one more? It's up to you. My name is Rafael. My name is David. My life was changed by a 26 years old college student. Her name is Joan. Gail and Roger. Her name is Jamie. My sponsor made room for one more. And that one more. And that one more was me. Was me. Sponsor a child through compassion today. Release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Greeting Chapel Street Church. Happy Easter. My name is Jonathan, and as you just saw, I was one of those children that someone made room for. I was born with all the odds not to be in front of you today. My dad wanted my mom to abort me. My mother's poverty affected me because of her lack of calcium. I spent most of my life walking without shoes. I was hungry for days. I worked as a dumpster diver. I spent part of my childhood selling juice on the streets. I was born out of my father's family and he hid me from them for 14 years. At the age of 12, he told me that I was a mistake in his life. And when I finally got into the Compassion Center, I spent five years fighting. I almost got out of the Compassion Center. Poverty was winning in my life. But God provided Jamie, my sponsor. When I was nine, he used my Compassion Center director, Dulce, to heal me and show me Christ. Through my sponsored letters, I was told that God is my father. I was not a mistake. I forgave my father and both share a good relationship today. I study public policy in Washington, D.C., and I hold a bachelor's degree in linguistics thanks to compassion. Most significantly, I am a follower of Christ, and I was baptized at the age of 12. My life changed because a mother from Michigan decided to make room for me. My mother graduated from university while I was attending the Compassion Center, and today she's a teacher. 
By the grace of God, I am a husband and a father of two. My second song is due this month. All of these, while I serve compassion in the Dominican Republic to release more children from poverty in Jesus' name. Thank you for sponsoring all these children from Ecuador and making room in your life for one more. God bless you. Well, as you heard Jonathan say, we uh, have a goal as a church family over the last three weeks, today's the final week, to sponsor 500 children in the, in the country of Ecuador. We have a long-standing connection with Ecuador as a country, as a nation. We're trying to help uh, the people of the compassion wipe the slate clean so there are no unsponsored children in Ecuador. And we're almost near the goal. And so perhaps you're watching this and God's moving in your heart. And right now, if you're here in person, in the lobby or online, you can scan the QR code, which will be on the screen. Uh, and you can, uh, in, online, you can do that. Or you can stop by the desk, the kiosk, if you're here in person after the service to sponsor a child. I think when you look at the world today, it's easy to be overwhelmed. The, the, the magnitude of the needs of people, uh, children in, that are hungry and in poverty and being displaced, the refugee crisis all around the world, the war in Ukraine, and the atrocities we see every day. And you can feel as if, like, well, what difference could I make? One of the things that we love about Compassion is they partner with local churches to make it possible for you to make a difference in the life of one more. The whole message of the gospel is God is making room for one more and one more and one more. And we're here because of that. We've been trying to make room for one more this morning for all of you that are here. Maybe you could do the same for $38 a month God could use that to change the life of a child. If the resurrection message only has meaning for those of us who dress up nice and feel comfortable in the suburbs once a year, then it has no meaning at all. It needs to have power for children like Jonathan. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning and bringing us here, in person and virtually, a chance to worship you, to praise your name, to lift our voices, and as we do, that your spirit would remind us of who you are because we forget. We forget who you are. Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we even resist. In this moment, we yield to you, Lord, and ask you to speak to us of your resurrection power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how many of you are Twitter followers, uh, but I saw this week that Elon Musk, who's apparently presently the wealthiest man in the world, I'm not sure how they calculate that, it seems to fluctuate, but he's number one, yay, that he has offered to, uh, to or he has made a bid to buy Twitter. Anybody see this? To purchase Twitter. Anybody know the price? For, yeah, you do know, you do follow Twitter. $43 billion, which is, it's staggering to me. Personal wealth of that much that you could just buy Twitter. And by the way, can you think of a few better uses of $43 billion than buying Twitter? I can, maybe some children that are hungry, but anyway, I'm not Elon Musk. $43 billion, and I started thinking about that. What, what happens to his massive amount of wealth when he dies? Where does it go? What, what will happen to it? Then I started doing some research about people that die with huge, uh, what they do with their fortunes, you know? It's a big deal. You, you want to make sure that you handle that properly. I read about this man who was named Luis Carlos de, La, de Narona, who was a wealthy bachelor from Portugal. He never married, never had children, and no living family members when he passed away. And he decided to split up his fortune in 70 parts, 70 equal shares, to give, given to people chosen at random from the Lisbon phone book. And they each received, in today's dollars, about $2 million. So he gave 70 people that he did not know, chose their names and read them in the phone book, $2 million. Can you imagine getting that letter? I don't know this guy. Yeah, he doesn't know you either. He just chose your name by the phone book. This kid. If you got that call or that, that message, what would you think? Scam. scam. Don't give them your email. They'll spam you for eternity, right? <laughs> but if it was $2 million, what's the number at which you would say, well, we should check? <laughs> like, I mean, I, it's probably not true, but it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, not for, not for a gas card, not for a Chili's card, but for a million dollars? Here's how I want you to think of the message of Easter, in all seriousness. What's being held out to us at the offer of the resurrection is so valuable that you better check. It's so significant that it's worth investigating. Is it real? Is it legit? It's too great not to explore it. And I don't mean dress up and come once a year. By the way, some of you I haven't seen in a while, welcome back, good to see you. Right? I mean, is it real, what we're talking about? And if so, what does it mean? What is it that's being offered? I, I think the message of Easter is more relevant today than it's ever been. Perhaps with the exception of the very first Easter. Think about what we've been through the last two years as a culture. 
When, is it, when in your lifetime have you ever seen a ticker on every screen all the time of a death count just running all the time? We live with that now. We talk about that. We see the refugee crisis around the world. We see the war in, in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, and we see atrocities on our screens. And by the way, that's happening all over the world all the time. We're just now seeing it on real, in real time every day. And I think people more than ever before are asking, well, wh where is hope for the future? What's, is there, maybe not for my lifetime, but for my kids, my grandkids? I mean, how, what's gonna happen in the world? Where can I find some hope? And we look in all the wrong places, typically, as human beings. In our culture, well, if the midterm elections go our way, there'll be hope. No, there won't. Well, if we could just avoid a recession and the economy will turn, there'll be hope. No. If we get our person in office at the right election, if we get the right policies, if we could just, if the UN could get its act together, if NATO, if whatever, it's always displaced hope. The offer of the resurrection is that there is hope for all of these questions, but it's not where you're looking. It's not where most of the world is looking. The message of Easter has never been more relevant. Those first Christians, you know, we have the benefit, those of you that are followers of Christ, we have the benefit of looking backward in history uh, and seeing these things. They did not have that benefit. The first Easter came and it was a shock. Nobody was looking for it. Nobody was expecting it. Jesus died on the cross and was buried and their hope died with him. Think about that. On Friday afternoon before sunset, that's when the Sabbath begins for Jewish people, and the Sabbath ends on sunrise on Sunday. Jesus died before the Sabbath, and they had to get him off the cross and in the tomb quickly, sometime before sundown Friday. From that moment until Easter Sunday morning when they discovered the empty tomb, there were no followers of Jesus on the planet. None. The men, the 12 followers, they scattered. The crowds that were cheering his name were, were not nowhere to be found. The women who came to the tomb weren't looking for a risen savior, they're looking for a corpse. Nobody was looking and expecting, they thought it was over. It was game over, lights out on the whole Jesus movement from Friday to Sunday. Something happened. Something happened because we're still talking about him. We're still preaching and proclaiming this. People are still having their lives transformed. What is it that happened? That's what we're gonna talk about. And each of the four Gospels makes it clear that not one of the disciples, those men that spent every day for three years with Jesus, and they heard him say repeatedly, the Son of Man must be crucified, and on the third day he must rise again. On day three I will rise. On the third day I'll rise from the dead. Like he said it over and over again. And you remember we had that countdown video before the service, 10, 9, 8, 7. On Sunday morning, before dawn, you don't find one disciple at the tomb going, 10, 9, 8, 7, here it comes. They're like, no. They're gone. It's over. Hope dead. Not one of them even said, you know, it's day three. Maybe we ought to check just to be sure. And those who did come were expecting to find a corpse. Something happened. We've been in a series on Mark's gospel. We started back in September called Following the King, and we come to the, the culmination, the best part, the resurrection, which is the end of Mark's gospel, but it's the beginning of the story for those of us who are his followers today. Let's read from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, remember we talked about that Friday at sundown to Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices. Pause there. These three women, by the way, there's one group of followers of Jesus that are at the cross, that are at the burial, and that are at the empty tomb first. And it's not the men. It's these women. Some of you ladies are like, I know, I've been telling him for years. <laughs> they're the ones that show up. But even they don't know what they're about to experience. So they might go and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll the stone away for us from the entrance to the tomb? They're not looking for a risen Jesus. Their question is, how are we gonna get in? To finish the job. Remember, they had to rush him off the cross and they hadn't finished the preparation according to the custom for burial. So they had to finish what they had started on Friday. That's why they're there, these faithful women. So devoted to Jesus, they wanted to bless him even in his death. Okay, we'll keep reading here. And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, pause there. If you went to a tomb that you expect to be sealed shut and it was open, would you just walk in? I'm not sure that I would, but they do. 
they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe. That's the biblical language for an angel. And they were alarmed. That may be a serious understatement from Mark's gospel. You think? Yeah. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. I want you to notice this. The first word of the resurrection is a word not to fear. Is a calming word of peace. This man, this angel, this messenger of God says, don't be alarmed. I know you're scared. I understand that. But something has happened that is going to cast out fear forever if you understand it, if you meet him. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, a real person in real history, who was crucified, who really died. You watched him die. He has risen. Those three words, which are in Greek, one single word, agerte, meaning he's been raised. Something has happened. The greatest miracle in all the world captured in a single Greek word, agerte, he has been raised. He has risen. See the place where they laid him. Skip the next slide there. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. There's a lot happening here in a few verses. Mark is the shortest, most concise of the Gospels, and he packs a lot into these few words in these few sentences. And, and, and if you've ever read the book, The Case for Christ, The Case for the Resurrection, by an author named Lee Strobel, who was an atheist journalist and put his journalistic research powers to, uh, toward the task of trying to prove Christianity wrong, and it eventually led him to faith in Christ. He says in the introduction to The Case for Christ, even as an atheist, I knew that the whole thing rises or falls on the resurrection. It's the whole ballgame. If, if Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if he has not been raised, then your faith is futile, pointless. I put on my Easter tie for nothing. You should go home and have whatever you, do whatever you want to do because we are playing a game here if he's not been raised. And you're still in your sins, he says. But if he has, it changes everything. Mark tells us that this group of women went to that tomb and they're expecting to find a corpse, but they still went and I would just suggest to you that Jesus works this way. If you have a, just enough faith to seek him in your despair, in your darkness, even in your doubt, even if you don't expect much, he's going to give you more than you bargained for. He does for these women. And he does still today. Mark doesn't include many of the details of Luke and John that put in their accounts, but he gives us enough. And there's so much here. Don't be alarmed. He is risen. He's not here. And then he says, you notice, see the place where they laid him. Did you catch that? So they're in this empty tomb. There's this guy standing there. They're freaked out. And the angel says, see where they laid him? And he points to what? What's he pointing to? Nothing. It's an empty place. But I think that's the point. Death has been emptied of its power. There's nothing there anymore. We stare at mortality and it makes us afraid. We, we lose a loved one. Someone's taken from us too soon. We see the death toll in the country and in the world and we fear. And the message of the gospel is you don't have to be afraid of that. Death has been emptied of its power. It does not have the final word. Look, look, you see, it's empty. Now there is good historical evidence for believing in the truth of the resurrection. One of those evidences is the problem of the empty tomb. Historical scholars, Christian and non-Christian, biblical sources, extra-biblical sources from the first century and following, all wrestle with this problem. And there's different, here's what's happening in the first century, in, at the moment. When the tomb is empty, the Jews think the disciples stole the body to, pro, to promote this hoax. The disciples think the Jews, the Romans have taken the body. The Romans aren't sure because they put a guard over the tomb. But here's what nobody is saying. He's still in there. You find no account of anyone claiming that he's still in there. There are third century accounts of an, uh, that, that the women got the location of the tomb wrong. <laughs> really? Well, you know, women aren't good at directions. I didn't, this is the first century. No, I didn't say this. I'm not saying this. And they come to the tomb early in the morning, and it's dark, and they're confused, and they're full of grief, and they just get the location wrong. Really? The disciples, too? The angels sitting in the wrong tomb? The guards are outside the wrong tomb. Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb it is, he could have just said, hey guys, over here. It's three tombs over, right? I don't think that explains what's happening there. 
In fact, the fact that all four gospel writers record specifically that it's women and the names of the women who were the first to see the empty tomb and to see the risen Jesus and to proclaim the good news of his resurrection is itself evidence that this is a real story. Because in the first century, women in, in, in both the Jewish context and in the, in the broader Roman world were not considered credible witnesses even in court. You go to the city of Ephesus today, you see the ruins of Ephesus, there's a massive ruins of the library of Celsus. It's, it's huge, massive, and incredible. I hope to be there someday. Celsus was a was hostile to Christianity, a, a, a historian writing in the second century. Here's what he writes. We cannot believe the claims of these Christians because their whole faith is based on the hallucinations and gossip of women. That's Celsus again said that, not Pastor Jeff. Here's the point. If you're making, if you, maybe you've heard this criticism. You know, you, the Gospels have been doctored over time. They changed what's in there. They gave us the books they wanted, and they rewrote this story to prop up this, this legend about a, a, a rising from the dead. If, if that's the case, you would never write it this way. Nobody would believe it in the first century, and they didn't believe it for this reason. In fact, what, something else, not one of the Gospel writers puts themselves in the story as the hero. Like, they don't, none of them say, I was the one guy who was there. I'm the one who got it. They all acknowledge they fled and the women were the first to see and to proclaim. In fact, if we go on in the story, verses nine through 15, now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene from whom he cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive, they were so excited, they were high-fiving, they were running around the room. No, what does it say? They would not believe it as we go on. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them. By the way, this is a one-sentence story in Mark. You go to Luke 24, you can read the road to Emmaus story. That's what he's talking about. It's an incredible story. We don't have time to get into it this morning. As they were walking in the country, and they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterwards, he, Jesus, appeared to 11 themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief, their hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, which is the proper response if somebody's raised from the dead. You talk about it. You don't keep that to yourself. You go and tell. They did not believe. Here's the point. The first century believer, the Christians, were just as unlikely to believe in a resurrection as many people are today. We tend to think, well, those are ancient people. They're superstitious. They, ha they believe in supernatural things. They're easily fooled. Look, just because they don't have iPhones in their pockets doesn't mean they're idiots. In fact, they're smarter than us in many ways. C.S. Lewis talks about we're guilty of today of chronological snobbery. We think we've figured it all out, and we haven't. We can learn something from those that have come before us. They were not predisposed to believe in the resurrection, but they did come to believe. They lived for it, and what's more, they died for it. The explanation of the empty tomb has to be dealt with. And you can't argue that they got the location wrong. Nobody's producing a body. How easy for the Romans or the Jews to say, oh yeah, this Jesus movement thing? Look, here's the corpse. We, we prove it. Remember when Osama bin Laden was killed and there's all this, how do we recognize the body, make sure that it's him? Think about it. If they want to put down the Jesus thing, produce the body. It's over. Nobody does that. Nobody says that's done. There's the swoon theory. Have you heard the swoon theory? It means Jesus didn't die, really. He was tortured and beaten and exhausted and near death, so near death that they mistook him for being dead, like in The Princess Bride. He was mostly dead, not all dead. And they put him in the tomb. And there, beaten half to death, looking like he's dead, in a dark, damp tomb in the first century, without medical attention, he gets better. So much better that he can move the stone away from the inside. If you believe that, you've got more faith than I do. No, the, 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 you have to wrestle with what, what's happening here. But our faith isn't just based on an empty tomb. This is important. It's not like the tomb is empty, therefore we infer that he's raised and we build up this religion. It's the empty tomb which leads to the eyewitnesses. This is the second critical evidence of the resurrection. The eyewitnesses. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15. 
Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Paul says, I'm gonna remind you of the gospel, the good news, the truth. Okay, then he says, for I have delivered to you as of first importance. So we should, we should sit up and pay attention. What's first importance, Paul? What's most important of the gospel? Now, Paul, look at, notice what Paul's not gonna say. He's not gonna say what's first important is that you love your neighbor as yourself. That's important, but it's not a first importance. He's not gonna say the 10 commandments or these religious rules or believe these intellectually these things or follow this philosophy of life. What is first importance to Paul? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. That he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. What's the gospel? Here's the point. The gospel is not good advice. The gospel is not a good philosophy to follow. The gospel is not good religious rules. The gospel is not, here's the best way to live your life. I think it is the best way to live your life, but that's not fundamentally of first importance. Here's what's of first importance. Something happened. Jesus Christ died. He was buried and he rose. All happening according to the scriptures. And he appeared. Remember, that's how Paul mentions some of them are still alive. Most are still alive. Why does he say that? Go check is what he's saying. Go ask them. I'm naming them for you. They're walking around. I'm not making this up. I'm citing my sources. This is what matters most. Because if this is true, then we need to take seriously what Jesus taught. Then we need to submit ourselves to the word of God. And then this book has power and authority if it's true. If it's not true, then, you know, pick the philosophy of your choosing. Whatever works for you, which many are doing in our culture today. Paul says, I deliver to you of first importance that something has happened in history and it changes everything, that Jesus Christ rose. I mentioned the first two evidences, the empty tomb and the eyewitnesses. By the way, if, you're a, if you'd like to read, I would suggest to you Richard Baucom's book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. He chronicles this, how our faith is based on eyewitness account and how these accounts are reliable. But the resurrection is not just based on that. It's not a past event that we believe happened once upon a time. It's a present power and hope for right now, for today. Here's the mistake we tend to make. Either it's just history that's interesting or it's some vague future that I don't really know much about. When I go to heaven, I float up and I get like baby wings or something and I'm, I'm just kind of muddling through in the here and now. The resurrection is a promise of his presence and power now, right now. So much so that the apostle P Peter will spend 30 years of his life, the next 30 years, traveling all around the Roman world with telling this story over and over and over again to everyone who will listen. Planting churches, sharing the gospel, telling the story of Jesus. And he ends up in Rome, and he's in prison, and he doesn't know it yet, but he's not gonna make it out alive. He's gonna end up being crucified upside down at his own request, because he didn't think he was worthy to die the same way as his master. And he's got a friend with him named John Mark, who is the author of the Gospel of Mark. And John Mark was not there at the resurrection, but has become a follower since. And he's become Peter's traveling companion and buddy. And he records things. And, and I imagine it like this. They're in Rome, and Mark is saying to, to Peter, tell me one more time. I gotta get this down. People need to hear. Go slow. Do that part again with the empty tomb again. Like, tell me again, Peter. And Peter recounts it for him so that we would know. Now I wanna go back to one last verse. In Mark 16, verse seven. But go tell his disciples and Peter. You notice that? This is the angel's words to the women. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Wasn't he one of the 12? Why do they name him? Why, why mention him specifically? Why not James and John and Bartholomew? What about the rest of them? You know why. If you read the New Testament, Peter's the one who denied he even knew Jesus. When he's being beaten and put on trial unjustly, Peter's in the back of the crowd and a servant girl says, you're one of them, and he swears he doesn't even know the man. And he watches him die from a distance and he runs away and the Bible says he weeps bitterly. Peter knows what it's like to give up hope. Peter knows what it's like to have it all over and done with, to feel like this whole thing has come crumbling down around him. So the 
angel says, make sure you mention Peter's name. Don't you think Peter's going, did he say me? By name? Me? Because Peter's thinking, if he's really raised, <laughs> the last thing I want to do is have to face him. After what I did, after what I said, there's a second chance for me? I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm beyond hope. No, he said your name, Peter. And he says yours. And he says mine. And I would think if Peter were here today, he would lean in and he would say, look, some of you are on the verge of giving up hope, and I've been there. I've been in the back watching him die and running away. I know what it's like to feel like it's over. In fact, I know he would say this because he actually did say this in a letter called 1 Peter. We'll read this and we'll be done. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter spent three years of his life following Jesus before the crucifixion and the resurrection trying to make himself a worthy disciple to prove that he was worth it, a true follower, and it came to nothing. After the resurrection, he puts it this way. He did it, not me. He's caused something in me that I, for all my effort, could not bring about in myself. He's the one who raised himself from the dead, and he can raise me too, he can raise you. To what? A living hope. Not some vague wish dream about the future, but a present living hope in your life right now. How do I know this? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's the whole ballgame. It's everything. I said at the start of the sermon that Easter has never been more relevant than it is right now. It's our prayer that it would be more relevant to you than it's ever been in your life. That you would know the presence and power and the living hope of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the offer of Easter, and it's worth everything. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these ancient words which are so relevant to us. Forgive us for taking them lightly. I know there are some here this morning and some listening. They know about you, but they don't know you. They don't really know and experience this living hope. God, by your spirit, speak to them right now of what's being offered to them because of your resurrection. Forgiveness, freedom, life. And for many of us, we just drift. We just forget and lose sight and we're distracted and it's so good to be reminded that you're a risen and reigning king. We worship you and we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name, amen. I said at the outset, the offer of the resurrection is too great for you not to take seriously. It's the most relevant offer, the most magnificent, glorious offer the world has ever known. It's our prayer that it becomes the most relevant thing in your life this Easter and every day going forward. Brothers and sisters, go now in the grace, power, strength, love, and mercy of the risen King Jesus. Amen, and happy Easter.